bringing low-level systems online. Cracking the case in 30 seconds. I want everyone at their station. Everyone, sir? Everyone. And Cortana. Hmm? Let's give our old friends a warm welcome. Halo Combat Evolved, a game so influential, it created a multi-billion dollar franchise, revolutionized the FPS genre, and is credited as being the biggest reason why Microsoft was able to grab a foothold in the video game industry. Halo 1 defines the word legendary in every sense. Its reputation, critical and commercial success, the gameplay, captivating soundtrack, incredible setting, beautiful graphics, split-screen co-op, land parties, and its pure form of arena multiplayer. There's certainly a reason why Combat Evolved is the highest rated video game on the Xbox, why it was labeled the killer app, and why it coined the phrase Halo Killer. There's a reason why Master Chief has become a household name and a gaming icon, as well as the face of the Xbox. If you got a great game and it's only available on Xbox and it's the thing that everybody's excited about, then they're gonna go out and buy Xboxes. Microsoft's development team, Bungie, provides the must-have game for the season. Every single piece of Halo lore, every novel, product, toy, accessory, every Halo-themed Xbox or controller spawned from this game. I mean, I could end this video right now and just bring up the ridiculous numbers. 13 games, 65 million copies sold, over 20 novels, and so on. It doesn't take anything less than a masterpiece to create a franchise of this magnitude. But is all this praise and success still relevant? Does Halo 1's story and gameplay hold up after all these years? And what about some of the more controversial aspects, like the recycled areas, the Flood, or the infamous Library? Is Halo Combat Evolved, a 16-year-old game, worthy of being called a masterpiece? Before we get started, let's remember a few things. 1. The expectations and landscape of the gaming industry in 2001. Two. We are not judging Halo by today's standards, but we can compare it to modern games for reasons I'll explain later. 3. This is the first game in the Halo series, so remember that neither Bungie or Microsoft knew if this game would even be popular. So with that said, let's keep our pistols loaded and crash our life pods straight into this. Why do we always have to listen to this old stuff, Sarge? Watch your mouth, son. This stuff is your history. It should remind you, Grunts, what we're fighting to protect. You can learn a lot from a game, movie, from its introduction. And what Halo does at the very beginning is set the tone and establish the setting. Right off the bat, the opening cinematic is showing us what's important. This mysterious space ring, the Pillar of Autumn, and the characters on board. The music creates a sense of mystery and a foreboding atmosphere that captivates the player right away. After that, we see troops, tanks, and pelicans all preparing for battle as the music changes to reflect that. And then we see one of the greatest motivational speeches of all time. Man, we let those dumb bugs out to the middle of nowhere to keep from getting their filthy claws on Earth. But we stumbled onto something that's so hot for that they're scrambling over each other to get it. Well, I don't care if it's God's own son of a bitch machine or a giant hula hoop, we're not gonna let them have it. What we will let them have is a belly full of lead and a pool of their own blood to drown in. Am I right, Marines? Sir, yes, sir! Mm-hmm. Damn right I am. Within three minutes, you get the sense that this is gonna be some epic sci-fi action game surrounding a mysterious ring. And that's exactly what it is. During every cutscene and minute of gameplay, Halo sets a deliberate, authentic tone and feeling through its visuals, sound design, and music. While Marty O'Donnell is our lord and savior, his work is impressive. The soundtrack is simply timeless. But more importantly than the music itself is the pacing. At what points do you hear which songs? Halo doesn't assault your eardrum with music playing over every second of the experience. Sometimes you don't hear anything, and that's a good thing, because it means those moments when you do hear music are much more impactful and memorable. 
whether it be action-packed carnage, stealthy precision, or mysterious wonder, Combat Evolved has a song for everything it wants you to feel. The soundtrack overall has a well-defined identity, and it's because of the music that Halo has a unique feeling from start to finish, and this opening cutscene sets the stage perfectly. But it's not just the opening cinematic or music that gives the game a powerful feeling, it's also the control. It's not good, it's not great, or even awesome. It's fucking perfect. The control is so fluid and natural, you won't even be thinking about it. It's simple, fair, balanced, and reliable, meaning that any mistake the player makes is entirely their own fault. Now, Combat Evolved was by no means the first FPS game, but it was the first that brought intuitive controls to the console market. It made shooters accessible to the casual gamer who didn't have a computer. Even games like Goldeneye, Perfect Dark, and Banjo-Tooie that came out on the Nintendo 64 didn't have the same long-lasting impact on the gaming industry like Halo did. The controls set a clear standard for the franchise and the industry moving forward. And this was because aiming with four buttons just didn't feel as good as aiming with a control stick. Also, the controller was made for people with three arms. And, uh, most, most people don't have three arms. Now, a lot of the younger kids might not know this, but when the original Xbox controller, the Duke, came out, it was a laughing stock. And not just because it's as big as your mom. <laughs> But because the idea of playing a game with two control sticks, it was considered crazy at the time. For the controller, mm -hmm. with the features that we wanted, which was two analog sticks that were sort of off, yeah. put things that seem obvious now, which were batshit at of. that point. Yeah. Right? Prior to Halo's release, PC FPS games dominated the market, and most people didn't want to venture away from a mouse and keyboard to play a shooter. But Combat Evolved changed all of that. An important aspect of the game was how it also limited the player to two weapons. Most other shooters had you juggling a wide array of weapons all at the same time, and if you wanted to use grenades in melee, you'd have to cycle through a menu to use them. It's crazy to think the formula for almost all FPS games since Halo can trace their roots and inspiration back to it. To see just how revolutionary this game was, all you have to do is look at any shooter released since Halo. How similar is the control scheme? How many of them have a two-weapon system, regenerating health, a specific button for melee and grenades, vehicle combat, and a greater emphasis on the AI? It's also worthy to mention that Bungie gave players different options, so if the default control didn't feel right, you could always change it. There's so many things that Halo revolutionized in the FPS genre, it's mind-blowing to think about. System link gaming, LAN parties, four-player split-screen co-op campaign, and having an actual story when most games didn't bother or didn't have much. In 2002, Halo was the first real first-person shooter game I ever played, and when I stepped out of that life pod onto that gigantic ring, my world changed forever. And so did the gaming industry. If there's anything that shows us Combat Evolved is a masterpiece, it's the gameplay and the difficulty. Not just from mission to mission, but as a whole. What Halo does best is create a fun, fair, balanced, and challenging video game experience. And quite honestly, it does this better than every other Halo game, and most first-person shooters that I've played. Now that's a bold statement, Cotton, and it might not pay off, but I've had a lot of experience with these games. I've beaten every campaign on Legendary multiple times, so I have a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. First, we gotta ask ourselves, why is it important for a game to be challenging and fair? Well, the long and short of it is, our brains reward us when we overcome challenges. The more difficult, the better we feel after accomplishing it. Our brains punish us when we don't succeed. There's a fine line every person walks between failing but getting up and failing so many times you decide to quit or take a break. Dark Souls is the epitome of this concept, and Combat Evolved is its FPS counterpart. Now don't get me wrong, both Dark Souls and Halo on Legendary are very hard games. But the same principles of overcoming that difficulty is what makes them so satisfying. Because the amount of times you will fail in Combat Evolved because of some bullshit, some straight up bullshit, 
is almost non-existent. When you die, 99% of the time, it's your fault. And that's a good thing, because you have control over your fate. You don't feel cheated. You feel like you can handle whatever this game throws at you if you play smart and well. Failing is the best way to learn. While doing my legendary no death challenge, every time I failed, I went back and saw what happened. And the answer was crystal clear to me, so I could alter my playstyle in certain areas to achieve success. I've beaten Combat Evolved on Legendary without dying once. But I don't think that is possible in any of the other campaigns. That's because Combat Evolved contains almost no artificial or bullshit difficulty. Almost. Now I want to stress that just because a game is challenging doesn't mean it's fun or fair. Sure, it might be hard to consecutively shoot 13 sniper jackals with pinpoint accuracy, but is that fun? Of course it might be challenging when enemies can kill you with an undodgeable melee attack that happens within one sixth of a second, but is that fair? What it boils down to is the best games are fun and challenging without being unnecessarily frustrating. So with this brief summary of why difficulty is important in video games, let's look at what Combat Evolved does well and what it doesn't. Rocket Launcher Flood. Bullshit. These enemies are honestly the only thing that is unfair, because they have a one-shot kill weapon, but don't have a predictable animation when they fire it. Anything that can kill you instantly needs to be telegraphed, so you can hear the mortar of the wraith. Sword Elites will yell, giving you a moment to react. You'll mostly encounter these guys in one mission, and they die as easily as the other Flood, so it's not super frustrating. You could argue that the vehicle physics are pretty hilarious, and for multiplayer I definitely agree. But because of how old this game is, and being one of the first competent FPS games to integrate vehicles, you really can't criticize it for that. Everything new has to start somewhere. I'd love it if you'd stop killing my man! I've heard people complain that the checkpoint system is unfair, but in the 15 years I've played this game across three different consoles, I can safely say any problems with checkpoints in Combat Evolved are incredibly rare or non-existent. The big thing people criticize this game for is its repetitive level design, and we'll definitely talk about that later. But that's a pretty short list of complaints for a game people have had 16 years to criticize, and I think that's an indicator of just how sound the game design was. In my Halo 4 review I talked about how Halo is like a chess game, because each enemy you fight has a unique role, with obvious strengths and exploitable weaknesses. So let's look at our cast of enemies. Grunts are the cannon fodder. They have strength in numbers, but are weak on their own. They can toss grenades, carry heavy weapons, and run in terror if their elite is killed. Elites are high-ranking soldiers of the Covenant. They can be invisible, carry swords, and in the later levels throw grenades. These guys are smart, cunning, and will put up a very strong fight. Jackals are defensive, and will usually try and hold a specific position, so you need to be precise or use grenades wisely to get past them. Hunters are tanky mini-bosses that roam in pairs. They have powerful fuel rod cannons, but a predictable melee and crippling weakness to the pistol and sniper. The Flood are all about swarm tactics. They'll charge and try to overwhelm you, and by shooting off their limbs you can eliminate their ability to attack you up close and at range. Finally, Sentinels are flying, laser-spewing robots. The beauty of Halo's design is you have to think about the best strategy in order to progress through the level. The exciting gameplay comes from the different combinations of enemies and how you the player decide to deal with them. Most importantly, no one strategy is always the best strategy. For example, a plasma pistol may be perfect at dealing with sentinels and elites, but it's far less effective against hunters and flood. A rocket launcher is good against everything, but you can't use it all the time because its ammo is limited. The sniper is effective against most enemies, but it's useless against the flood. So when you combine the two weapon system, the predictable unique designs of the enemies, what happens is the player starts playing with intention. They start making meaningful decisions. This is what makes a game so fun and interesting, because you're subconsciously thinking about which route to take, which enemies to kill, when, why, and with what weapons or vehicles. These are the fundamentals of Halo that turn the gameplay into a sort of dance, where you move and jump to avoid damage, while also finding the best position to deal damage. There's always more than one way to get the job done. 
Halo was absolutely groundbreaking for the design of its artificial intelligence. The enemy is always strategizing and thinking of the best way to kill you. Every enemy and vehicle you face gives you audio and visual cues that allow you to predict its behavior. There are countless examples of this within Halo's gameplay, and even if you might never have thought of it, your brain recognizes these patterns and reacts to them instinctively. If you're driving by a group of Covenant, most of the time they'll jump out of the way, so you have to adjust how you drive if you want to run them over. When a marine, grunt, or elite throws a grenade, you can see the animation and hear them yell. Seeing a shade turret in your vicinity means it's possible for both you and the enemy to use it, so you have to keep an eye on them. If you don't see an enemy on your radar, you can listen closely for the sound of their footsteps. You may walk into an area with enemies that are unaware of your presence, and you'll see them casually patrolling the area, or even taking a cute little nap. No, oh, isn't it adorable? Die! You should die! When they notice you, they'll shout out to their allies and alert them. For most every action taken by the enemy, you, the player, are given time to react. By learning how enemies will react to your actions, that is how you can master the game and play through on the hardest difficulty without dying once. But I want you to ask yourself, Without exploits, is that realistically possible for any of the other Halo games? I wouldn't think so. This is why I believe Combat Evolved has the best gameplay in the series, and one of the best in the FPS genre, because it can be learned and mastered to such a degree, and still be challenging and fun. What Halo gives you that most other FPS games don't is a buffer. It gives you a generous room for error. Your health bar is what protects you when you get into a rough spot or make a mistake. So rather than instantly punishing you with death, the game gives you a chance to recover from your mistakes without having to constantly restart from the checkpoint. This also brings in an interesting mechanic where you have to manage your health and power-ups. So it's not about just waiting for your health to regenerate, you have to actively seek these power-ups and health packs. There's always been a lot of subtleties in Combat Evolved that I really appreciate, and I'd like to highlight a few of them that stand out. What's really cool is the difference in difficulties doesn't just tweak the numbers in terms of damage and health. Changing the difficulty changes the game. Some areas might have invisible sword elites on heroic and gold sword elites on legendary. Ranks might get higher, or the combination of enemies will change. Even the opening and ending cutscenes change, and you just gotta love the level of blood in this game. It's ridiculous, it's over the top, and man does it feel like a battlefield when you stop and look around. I really enjoy the amount of personality Bungie injected into each of your marine allies. And the Covenant. They all feel, look, and talk different. And it gives the game an unforgettable charm. We showed them! Look! A Mach 5! You won't die instantly in Combat Evolved when you walk out from cover like in Halo 2. You won't be fighting in ridiculously hard vehicle sections where the Marines take more bullets than you, like Halo 3. You don't die by undodgeable insta-kill melee attacks a la Reach 4 and 5. You don't die from bullshit you can't predict. And it's because CE is more focused on making the game fair that you can easily learn from your mistakes despite how challenging it is, and not be forced to repeat the same section until you do it perfect. These are the main reasons why Combat Evolve's gameplay is so fun, challenging, and revolutionary. And when you think about it, it's no wonder why the game holds up so well 16 years later. Most people might not know this, but Halo Combat Evolved wasn't just a first-person shooter. It was actually two games in one. You might be asking, how could Halo be more than just an FPS game? Well, I'll show you. No kill timers, no sky ceiling, and only one invisible barrier that you can crash into if you drive through water for five minutes. You see in most games, even the newer Halos, they'd simply put a barrier there or make the water kill you instantly. But in Combat Evolved, the levels don't restrict the gameplay in any way, and that gives players motivation to explore them in whatever form of insanity comes to their mind. That's the beautiful thing about this game, it was ripe for tricks, exploits. There were ways to get out of just about every level, 
Some so outrageous you wonder how the hell people figured them out in the first place, and some so easy anybody could do them. The game doesn't limit you in any way, which is a stark contrast to how on rails and controlled most FPS games have become. This right here is one of the most vivid videos I remember watching. A guy named Miss Man was able to get this shade turret in a specific position on the cliff and managed to melee it all the way down to the bottom of the level. I mean, what? Like, how the fuck did you figure that out, dude? After watching this as a kid, I realized just how many possibilities there were to explore the game. There was a seriously dedicated group of gamers that wanted to do tricks like they were all in a goddamn biker gang. The hardest of the hardcore. Exploring these levels was like playing something else entirely, and I've always had this desire to see more of the game, to see those hidden parts I wasn't meant to get to, or view things from a different perspective. There's something so fascinating about Halo, its architecture, and its visuals. It wants you to explore. The fact that the game actually has a scripted moment for when you start murdering people on the bridge just goes to show how free you really are. I gave you an order, soldier. Get off this ship. What the hell are you doing? Security to the bridge. The Master Chief has gone rampant. Take him down, boys. I mean, how many games are there where jumping around the level becomes something of an art form? Even without exploits, Halo has this tremendous feeling of freedom. Of course, Bungie was very clever with the Easter eggs they put in. And it's these little things that you tell your friends about and share a good laugh, or show them how you got to this secret spot. This go-wherever-the-hell-you-want type of attitude just doesn't exist in FPS campaigns anymore, and it's one of the things that made Combat Evolved feel so expansive. It doesn't matter how fun or awesome the core gameplay is if there aren't interesting locations to play in. Level design needs to complement the gameplay. And let me tell you, Combat Evolved has some of the best level design you'll ever see. It's mind-blowing to think about how much thought Bungie put into each mission. Again, you might not have thought of this before, but what Halo does so well is give you something new with each mission. The elements of the game unravel in increments. It doesn't just throw everything at you right off the bat. Imagine if Captain Keys gave you a pistol, and then you started seeing sword elites, hunters, floods, spec ops, enemies, wraiths, banshees, and all that crazy shit. It'd be too much. It's because Halo reveals new things at the right moments that the game keeps your interest the entire time. First mission makes you feel powerless. You don't jump out of the cryo tube and start wrecking the place. You're introduced to the enemies. You see how they fight without being able to fight them. The level is mostly corridor shooting, teaching you how to use grenades, take cover, the basics. Second mission opens up, lets you roam wherever, the opposite of the corridors on the Pillar of Autumn. Then you're introduced to dropships, banshees, jackals, the sniper rifle, and warthog. Third mission introduces the role of stealth. You'll notice there's no pistol here either, because the game wants you to learn how to use the sniper. Then it throws hunters, turrets, invisible elites, and sword elites at you. This is the entire game in a nutshell, with each level offering something new, but not completely changing it. And when the game takes elements away, it's for a deliberate reason. More noteworthy is the number of routes you can take to progress through encounters. For instance, even though Pillar of Autumn is mostly corridor shooting, there are different paths to take, flanking routes. Most FPS games are pretty linear, and even though Combat Evolved has eight linear missions, they don't really feel like it. Halo and the Silent Cartographer are the only non-linear missions in the series, aside from New Alexandria and Mombasa Streets. On Halo, you can save the Marines in any order you want. On Silent Cartographer, you can explore the levels in any way you want. I think it says a lot when a game this old manages to make non-linear levels when later games in the series hardly ever tried to do that. Whatever happened to that lost ambition? The level design can only be described as dynamic. For the first half of the game, I think everyone agrees Halo 1 is awesome, but it's when we get to the seventh mission, that mission, that problems start to arise. It's no secret that CE reuses levels, assets, and visuals, and the library is notorious for being repetitive and difficult. But are these criticisms as bad as people make them out to be? Let's look at Assault in the Control Room. You go through a series of rooms, bridges, and elevators that seem to be copy and pasted, but all these areas play differently. The enemy combinations are different, the gameplay is different, and that's what matters. Hypothetically, removing these somewhat redundant areas would make the overall game feel and look more unique. However, that would also make the game much shorter. And because the gameplay is so damn fun in the first place, I'm glad the levels are longer. Maybe if they looked and felt a little bit different, people wouldn't have criticized them as much. 
The library is when we get the real shit, as the only enemy is the Flood, and we're forced to fight them in very similar looking rooms. And while young me certainly hated this level, as an adult, I've actually come to appreciate it. Being hunted by a seemingly endless swarm of Flood might be frustrating for some, but to me, it's exhilarating. It provides pulse-pounding action, as you always have to be on your toes and keep a close eye on your radar. The Flood will hunt you from every conceivable angle. They spawn behind, above, in front, on the sides. They jump through doors, climb up walls. In this dimly lit labyrinth, you're constantly on edge as the unsettling music follows you throughout. On a thematic level, it works great, as this is the point where you realize what the Flood lack in brains and advanced tactics they make up for in numbers, and that's what makes them scary. This library that could have once been a mystical beautiful area is now overrun by the horrors it was meant to contain. While the level isn't the best Halo has to offer, I respect the library for the way it changes the gameplay, forces you to switch up your strategy, and adds elements of horror into its gameplay. I leave home for a few days and look what happens. This won't take long. Keys in the Maw do have you return to areas from before, but the levels are so vastly different with places you've never been that they are hardly similar to the previous missions. Then we come to Two Betrayals, a level that many people hate because it's simply assault in the control room backwards. But as I see it, this is the best and most entertaining level in the Halo franchise. As I said before, the landscape is reused, but the encounters aren't. Two Betrayals has a totally different tone and feeling than its counterpart. What makes this level so fun is the AI, as the game has turned into an all-out war between the Covenant, Flood, Sentinels, and you. Throwing the player into the mix of all these large-scale battles makes you feel small, but not powerless. You get a sense of scale and conflict as the Halo Ring is being devastated around you, and your choices for each encounter are numerous. Do you watch from afar and see how it plays out? Do you shoot everything without discretion? Or do you help one side destroy the other to make it easier on yourself? Making these choices and watching the AI fight each other is what makes the level so entertaining time and time again. To me, it doesn't matter that some of the levels have the same layout as before, because I'm playing them in a completely different way. If you enjoy the gameplay, then these flaws won't distract much from the experience. Combat Evolved gives you fun enemies to shoot, and interesting dynamic locations to fight them in, but it goes one step further by adding context and purpose to the gameplay. A story that you're invested in is what makes a good game become great. And what Halo does incredibly well is provide a reasoning behind the gameplay. The context of each level is told and shown to you through cutscenes and in-game dialogue. This allows players to get more invested into the combat as there is something at stake. And it's not just a kill these bad guys to advance type of game. Uh, coming here was reckless. You two know better than this. Thanks. There's always an important reason and urgency for what you're doing. From the very beginning, the consequences of the player's death are laid out before you. Which is where you come in, Chief. Get Cortana off this ship. Keep her safe from the enemy. If they capture her, they'll learn everything. Force deployment, weapons research, Earth. I understand. And all the way through to the end, your objective drives Master Chief's actions. The story always gives you a sense of urgency to accomplish your task, making it more intense. And I really enjoy how the Marines themselves play a role in the story. It creates a sense of unity, brotherhood, between you and your allies, and the cause you all fight for. The in-game dialogue is used to flesh out the universe and the Halo Ring, so as you play through, the exposition that Cortana or other characters gives you teaches you more about the setting. This cave is not a natural formation. Someone built it so it must lead somewhere. But what about the narrative itself? Well, as I said before, there's a reason why Halo has such a rich, expanded universe, and it's because this game planted all the right seeds. Prior to its release, neither Microsoft or Bungie knew if Halo would be a one-off game or something that would warrant a sequel, so they had to make the story self-contained with the potential for expanding upon. It's safe to say, Halo didn't become a one-off game, and the way it set up humanity, reach, the characters, Covenant, Flood, Forerunners, and the Halo Ring 
left the door open for a more in-depth look into all these elements, which is exactly what future games, books, and TV shows did in the future. A common criticism people make is that Combat Evolved doesn't tell you everything. You don't know the origins of the Chief, the Spartans, Covenant, or Reach. Now back then, games used to come with these things called manuals. Remember those? And in the manual, it tells you everything you need to know about the backstory. The question you need to ask yourself, what is most important and what does the audience need to know? Well, in the opening cutscene, if we had five minutes of exposition on the events of Reach, that would have taken away the intensity and urgency of the situation at hand. We don't need to know what exactly happened on Reach or who the Master Chief is, because what's more important is what is in front of us. Chief himself has been criticized as being a mostly flat character, but Halo isn't about the Master Chief. It's about his journey. Your journey. Having him remain silent through gameplay allows you to immerse yourself in his shoes, because you're not watching the events of Halo unfold in a movie theater, you're playing through them in a game. The point is, the mystery surrounding Chief is what makes him interesting, and having him be a blank slate allows you to more easily connect with the story, the universe, and this ancient ring of mass destruction. Combat Evolved's story is rather simple, but simple doesn't mean bad. As I said in my Reach review, some games have a story based around a setting, rather than dynamic characters. CE is no different, as the lens is focused on this foreign world and the secrets and conflicts that take place around it. It's a story of discovery, unraveling the mystery of an ancient world with action-packed moments that contrast the quiet parts. So much of the story is told through the levels themselves. For example, the game has you play through the attack on the Pillar of Autumn, giving you a first-hand look at how ruthless the Covenant are. Then you crash land and you're forced to seek out other marines to form a resistance. You see a bunch of downed life pods and you imagine what exactly happened. What are the stories of the marines in those life pods? Truth and Reconciliation puts you aboard a Covenant ship and you get some insight into their foreign technology. There's a moment in Two Betrayals when you're going through a room and you only encounter human flood with no weapons. Apparently these guys were meant to be the remnants of Fireteam Zulu that you save in Assault on the Control Room. If you look closely at the Proto Gravemind and Keys, you can actually see the Captain's Pipe nearby. Hope that last smoke was a good one. And earlier in the level we see the Flood gathering bodies in the corner, and it's just so freaking creepy. On the Maw you see the Pillar of Autumn in extreme decay. You go through a bunch of armories that have weapons all over the place, but none of them have any ammo. It makes it feel so desolate and empty. But the best in-game storytelling by far comes in the mission 343 Guilty Spark. The build-up and reveal of the Flood is one of the most iconic and vivid moments in video game history, and it's all done while you're playing through, without any exposition from Cortana. The description says, Creep through a swamp to meet the only enemy the Covenant fear. At the beginning, we see Covenant fleeing in terror of something. Then we come across a downed pelican with a mysterious foreboding distress call. A seemingly random explosion occurs, scaring the Covenant. Fighting our way through the fog-filled jungle, creepy music sets the tone, as we see what appears to be friendly marines in the distance. We go through a series of tunnels, there's this green goop dripping from the ceiling, you see all these flashing lights, and then there's needler ammo? And that's the moment you realize something is terribly wrong, because there's never been any needler ammo in the rest of the game. Then there's this marine that's gone insane, he shoots at you wildly and spouts crazy dialogue about some monsters. There's blood, explosions, bullet holes, and fire, and you're just like, Bruh, I didn't fucking do this. I was never here. At this point you're weirded out because of all this crazy shit, and there doesn't appear to be any elites here. Next you cross this light bridge and you see blood all over the place. What happened to these marines? And boy, you're about to find out. Oh, wait, what's that? What's that sound? What's what's happening? Ah! Ah! Get the hell away from me! Woo! And after encountering the flood, it hits you. The reason there aren't any elites in this level is because they're all flood now. Holy shit! And now you see how easily the Covenant and your allies fall against the flood without leadership. Oh yeah, all those dead bodies you saw on your way here? They're gone. There's even a part where you can go back to the elevator you came in on, and it fucking collapses. Damn! But eventually we get to the real elevator, thank god. And we're ready to get the hell out of here, but wait, what? Ah! 
You ever wonder how so much blood got on the walls here? It's because the flood were throwing dead bodies down the elevator shaft. I mean, this level is simply A plus storytelling, and it's not mandatory for you to see all this stuff, but it's there if you really pay attention. And Halo isn't shy of adding a bit of humor in an otherwise serious situation. This thing is falling apart. It'll hold. We're not gonna make it. We'll make it. You did that on purpose, didn't you? Chief and Cortana have a lot of memorable one-liners as well. Yeah! Now would be a very good time to leave. Punch it. Ah, sir! The characters weren't exactly deep, with expansive character arcs, and it's because they didn't need to be. Captain Keys, Cortana, Master Chief, and Guilty Spark all play important roles in how the story plays out. They got personality, they're charming, and the dialogue and voice acting is pretty damn good. I gave you an order, soldier, now pull out! He's delirious! In pain, we have to find him! Remember how I said CE was ripe for expanding upon? Well, that's exactly what 343 did with the anniversary terminals, adding that extra layer of depth to the characters in a way we all imagine them to be. Point is, Halo doesn't try to sell you a character-driven story, it tries to sell you a setting-driven story. And if it succeeds at what it attempts, why would it need to be anything else? There are some plot holes and moments that feel a bit too convenient, like the sudden appearance of a teleportation grid, but for me these things never took me out of the story. I was able to suspend my disbelief and roll with it, because I was having so much fun. Now we also have to remember that storytelling in first-person shooters had no real expectations at the time. If Halo launched and had cut 90% of its story and cutscenes out, nobody would have batted an eye. It's because Halo executed an ambitious idea so well, in a time where video game storytelling was still in its infancy, and the way it complemented it with great voice acting and music, that the narrative became so beloved in the first place. When you consider everything that Halo Combat Evolved brought to the table, the revolutionary impact it had on console and FPS gaming, along with its incredible soundtrack, dynamic levels, interesting enemies, fascinating story, the groundwork it laid for the franchise, the way it put Xbox on the map, and how its formula is still being replicated to this day, it seems impossible to classify this game as anything less than a masterpiece. A game this well designed deserves every piece of recognition and praise that it gets. And the fact that we're still talking about it, the fact that the game has been remastered twice and released on four different platforms, is a testament to Halo's well-deserved legendary status, and how well it holds up 16 years later. No game is perfect, and Combat Evolve certainly has its flaws, but as far as I'm concerned, this is as perfect as it gets. Calculating alternate escape route. The ship's inventory shows one longsword fighter is still docked in Launch Bay 7. If we move now, we can make it. 